Um, the, uh, the biographies of uh, our distinguished speakers this morning are uh, in front of you, so that saves a certain amount of work uh, for the chair. Uh, ministers, as you will know, uh, wherever they are ministers, whichever country, are usually under pressure, having diaries that are filled from uh, the early hours of the day to the very late hours of the day. Um, so um, Hugo Swire will lead for us this morning uh, and uh, then we'll take a few questions before his deadline occurs, and then we will go on uh, to hear from Professor Murphy and uh, hopefully um, Karen McKenzie before a full-scale discussion will take place. Hugo, I'm extremely grateful to you as the Minister of State of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office with very much the Commonwealth uh, in your brief uh, to be uh, lending your time to us this morning. Uh, you're very welcome, and I now call upon you to address the conference. I think this is meant for somebody even, even shorter than I am, so I'm going to kick away. I think Mr Sarkozy must be coming soon. <laughs> Don't repeat that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, Paul Cully's house again, to the heart of the House of Commons on this typically beautiful English spring morning. Um, I saw some of you struggling in, and I gather Westminster Bridge is temporarily closed just to... Uh, I see Alistair Ross from Northern Ireland. He'll think this is very good weather. Um, uh, and uh, you are welcome here. And I know it's not, not the nicest uh, uh, weather that we could possibly uh, offer you. I'm particularly keen to be able to speak this morning on the Commonwealth Charter. And can I thank, uh, to begin with, Sir Alan uh, and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for their valuable and tireless uh, work in the promotion of democratic values. It's also Great pleasure to see so many parliamentarians from across the Commonwealth here. And when I look around the parts of the world that I cover and in my non-Commonwealth bilateral capacity, everywhere from uh, Malta, of course, uh, well, I cover Malta as Commonwealth, but also countries like uh, Sri Lanka, where I've just returned from uh, over uh, last weekend. And uh, so it's an appropriate time, uh, I think, to come together uh, as parliamentarians, which is what we we all are, uh, in a year that, of course, marks the 800th uh, anniversary uh, of the Magna Carta. It was near to this uh, spot here in Westminster Hall, not far. In fact, in the Foreign Secretary's constituency of Runnymede that King John returned, uh, was signed the Magna Carta, and then returned here. The, the Magna Carta, which you'll be hearing a lot about, I'm sure, over the next uh, 24 hours or so, uh, or Great Charter, uh, limited a king's power and set us on a path in this country to democracy uh, and the rule of law. But we're here to discuss another great charter this morning, that of course being the Commonwealth Charter. The Commonwealth Charter, agreed by all member states and signed by Her Majesty the Queen at Marlborough House, built on those same Magna Carta principles. For the first time in Commonwealth history, we have a single statement aimed specifically at improving the lives of our citizens through our shared values, underpinned by the Commonwealth's own founding principles of liberty, equality and peace. But just over two years uh, from the Commonwealth Charter and 800 years from the Magna Carta, it is fitting that we take stock of the Commonwealth's role in the promotion and protection of human rights. And it is precisely because of my deep respect and admiration for the Commonwealth that I say it can and it must do more. For me, the rationale is simple. Not only is there a moral obligation to protect human rights and the rule of law, but there is a clear benefit to our security and prosperity. Magna Carta's groundbreaking concept of equality before the law, the understanding that power is not to be exercised in an arbitrary and unconstrained way, that the state 
is answerable to its citizens that there must be due process, in short, the rule of law, underpins the strong institutions, democratic freedoms and accountable government on which so many nations have built their success. And successful societies are, after all, the building blocks of global security and prosperity. Prime Minister David Cameron calls this the golden thread that enables nations to thrive. And we are fortunate to have such staunch allies in the promotion of our Commonwealth values as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, whose work shows the value of parliamentarians as drivers for progress on human rights. Or the Commonwealth Secretariat, in particular Karen McKenzie's team, supporting member states in completing their universal periodic review, strengthening the capacity of national human rights institutions and supporting election observation where the Commonwealth, incidentally, is a world leader. The Royal Commonwealth Society has done good work on LGBT issues. And the Commonwealth Foundation have developed important links bringing together civil society and government. But while there are clear advantages to the promotion of Commonwealth values, for some member states, challenges remain. For some, the Charter remains a purely aspirational document, and they are as yet to implement fully the commitments to which all members agreed in 2012. I recognise this. We should not shy away from the fact that implementing the Charter will take time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Indeed, the Magna Carta itself did not suddenly create a free and just society in the country overnight. Rather, it was a critical step on an incremental process towards parliamentary democracy as we know it. But that should not be an argument for members to delay taking positive steps to address the principles of the Charter, nor indeed to cherry-pick some of it and ignore the rest. Others argue that unlike the UN treaties, the Charter is not legally binding. Of course, this is true. But I would argue that the Charter's values and principles are nothing new. They simply reinforce the universal declaration of human rights. Note that word, universal. So I would argue that member states have not only a moral obligation to uphold and promote what they agreed to in 2012, but that it is in their own in interests so to do. For where political competition, rule of law and free speech are lacking, social stability will be vulnerable at best and absent at worst. Nor can innovation, entrepreneurialism or prosperity flourish. So in my view, member states have a responsibility to be active in their promotion and protection of human rights. And as parliamentarians and Commonwealth citizens, all of us should ask ourselves what more we can do to ensure that our own governments achieve this. And as well as our own domestic mechanisms, I would suggest that there is a role for the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group. CMAG, as it's known, is intended to be the custodian of political values. Its role, to my mind, is to review the membership's adherence to all the values of the Charter and to offer support and guidance to member states when they need it. But as we approach the next CMAG meeting in March, many will find it surprising that there is currently no country of concern on its formal public agenda. So I welcome 
the Secretary General's commitment to take a more proactive approach and use the meeting to reflect on the membership's adherence to the Charter's values. And finally, I am pleased that at our Heads of Government meeting in Malta uh, this November, the theme will be adding global value. We should use this opportunity to consider how the Commonwealth can add real value to advancing human rights, and not just within our own organisation, but to the wider international community. Malta has already identified women's rights as one area where the Commonwealth can add value. And I very much support the creation of a women's forum that will sit alongside the People's and Youth Forums. And we approached that meeting uh, in November uh, with some excitement and some hope and some optimism. I find that the words of Prime Minister Muscat of Malta echo my own thoughts when he said, change does not happen by itself or by accident. We need to work for change. So let us continue to work together on our common values and principles, from Magna Carta to the Commonwealth Charter, promoting and protecting individual rights for our collective success, making the Commonwealth more relevant in a dangerous and difficult world, and building the Commonwealth into the powerhouse of prosperity I know it can be. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Hugo. Um, bearing in mind your time constraints, perhaps if you were happy to take a few questions, um, perhaps uh, colleagues would uh, please show. Let's put the cat among the pigeons. Coffee, yes, yes, the lady over there. Oh, thank you, Chair. Denise Robinson, Shadow Minister for Women from South Africa. I was very encouraged by your words because we have great challenges and I was just wondering whether you could give me any indication of how a women's forum would be set up. I think that would be very helpful to many of us. Probably too early to give the details but I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Well, I would imagine it would be set up along the youth forums and other fora that there are at uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Um, I don't know what the Maltese have got planned. I've actually been uh, to Malta uh, a couple of times now and have been discussing with uh, the Prime Minister, who's been here as well, and also Phyllis Muscat, who's no, the same name but no relation, who is organising Chogham. There are two Maltese, distinguished Maltese members of Parliament with us here this morning, and I'm sure they would either be able to uh, tell us a little bit more about what's planned or give you Phyllis's contact details and you could speak to her directly. I know that she would be happy to, to speak to you. The UK, we're not involved in organising Chogham. We're just a member state, uh, as is South Africa in this respect. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Joseph uh, Lukong Banadzum from Cameroon. Uh, I have uh, quite often wondered uh, what the Commonwealth can do and is doing in relation to the absence of a country like, like uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was a member of the Commonwealth because of uh, her desire not to you know, fulfill some of the aspirations of the Commonwealth, she wow. withdrew. But the population and the entire country has been like hell hostage. And the Commonwealth has since kept quiet. How then are we sharing these common values when we know some members are excluded involuntarily or otherwise? Commonwealth has a set of rules like any club. And indeed, the Commonwealth Charter uh, was signed willingly by member states. And that's why my speech was about people actually looking at what they've signed up to and actually adhering to that and not, as I said, cherry-picking the bits that they find easy to live with 
and ignoring the bits they don't. And um, the universal values of human rights or the universal values of the Commonwealth apply to every member state equally. And it is simply impossible to have countries in the Commonwealth which don't adhere to those basic values. If you allow them in, it actually reduces the whole point, the ethos of, of the Commonwealth. I don't suppose there's uh, anybody in this room who doesn't look forward to the day when Zimbabwe uh, comes back into the family of the Commonwealth. Equally, I don't suppose there are many people in this room who think that the time is right uh, under the current leadership of that country. Uh, gentleman from India. Thank you, sir. Sir, challenges are huge before these Commonwealth countries. And the common will or common welfare, common welfare will be, should be the wealth of the Commonwealth. Is it possible to, to redress the challenges of education, health, societal security, economic prosperity? Can we pool together our resources, all the Commonwealth countries, is it possible? that we pool together our resources, whether human right, whether in this uh, human resources, in technology, in other fields, is it possible? Well, look, we look forward to India playing an even greater role under Prime Minister Modi in the Commonwealth. I think India has a huge role to play, a positive role to play within the Commonwealth and to show some real leadership. I, I think when we talk about, um, you know, some countries in the Commonwealth see the Commonwealth as a sort of talk about schools, hospitals, road, infrastructure. The Commonwealth is not per se a development agency. We have other development agencies. In our country, we have, uh, we have the Department for International Development. We donate 0.7% of our GDP uh, to international aid. And we give a further amount, about 16% of any EU aid is given by the British people as well. So we are a huge international aid donor. The Commonwealth is more than about aid. It is about as you say, it is about youth, education, common values, and yes, it's about trade. And if you are of my political thinking, that uh, a rising tide lifts all ships, that means trade, that means prosperity. And I very much welcome the inauguration, as it were, of the Commonwealth Business and Enterprise Investment Council under Lord Marland, um, which has already had one or two good meetings about uh, infrastructure investment and so forth. And we should all uh, support this new initiative because I think trade answers those questions uh, in many ways. The alleviation of poverty lifts people out of poverty, deals with inequality. And also, when two people or two countries trade with each other, that in itself is an extremely good way of building bilateral relations beyond the politics beyond the diplomacy, just human relations that can build up through trade. So I think the Commonwealth 54 countries is a great trading bloc. I think we have never maximised the uh, importance of trading within the Commonwealth. We know it's easier and cheaper for two Commonwealth countries to trade with one another than outside the Commonwealth, and we need to give that a huge push. Yeah. Margaret Mitchell, Scotland. Just on international aid, um, does uh, Mr Squire, and very much enjoyed your, your speaking this morning, agree that it's important Commonwealth countries uh, prioritise that, keep this up in order to, to help these struggling democracies that might be prey to and vulnerable to um, influences that do not value human rights? Yes, I do. That's why I'm so, so keen on it. I also think that some countries have made the point to me, and I think this is a very relevant thing, is that some of the big countries in the Commonwealth, and let's take uh, the United Kingdom as one, are members of a lot of uh, international fora. You know, in our case, the EU, NATO, G8, uh, UN Security Council, you name it, OECD. And some of the smaller countries in the Commonwealth are not, for obvious reasons. So I think there's a role to play by the bigger countries who sit around these tables to try and reflect and represent more the concerns of some of the smaller countries on issues such as health, education, uh, human rights, and particularly climate change, because of a lot of our, 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 our brother and sister member states of the Commonwealth are extremely vulnerable to climate change and rising tides. And I think the blue economy, which I know countries like the Seychelles are very keen on, uh, is, has a huge role to play. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I'm just wondering whether you can invoke the Commonwealth Charter uh, to put your grip on the 
for example, the international, the ICC court. Uh, because the, I'm seeing the fear of, uh, like, for example, the African Union leaders, the AU, they want to form their ACC court. And uh, my fear is that the 16th Charter stands to be violated. What is it that you can do to ensure that uh, um, the countries who ratify the Commonwealth Charter are made accountable to it? Well, clearly, the more countries that sign up to the ICJ, then come subject to the ICC, as it were, and uh, we can prosecute uh, people who have violated basic human rights in that way. I think it's terribly uh, important. I've just returned from uh, the weekend from uh, Sri Lanka, a great Commonwealth member of the family with a new government, and, of course, everybody knows there's a United Nations uh, Human Rights Committee uh, in the council investigation into what went on in Sri Lanka, particularly in the closing days of the terrible, civil, effectively civil war there. And it is important that uh, people are held to account. I think this uh, immunity or impunity for gross violations of human rights besmirches democracy, undermines the Commonwealth. So um, I would say that the proper place for these prosecutions is in the uh, ICC, but that means that countries have to sign up to it. Mr. Swaya, my name is Harsha De Silva, member of the new government in Sri Lanka. I've uh, noticed your tweets uh, where you were in Colombo, Jaffna, uh, and so on. Uh, very uh, glowing comments, excellent uh, meetings you say you had. Um, you know, there is a, a lingering issue about the prosecutions in the ICC as opposed to uh, doing some, uh, or rather, uh, holding them accountable, if at all, in in Sri Lanka. Uh, what is your view? I mean, is it is it necessary that uh, these people, if um, at all alleged to have uh, violated human rights, be taken to the Hague, or couldn't we uh, do it domestically? Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, I think through you, I would first of all like to thank uh, President Sirisena for receiving me. I was the first minister from any country he met, and uh, the Prime Minister Raniel Wick Remasinga, and all the others I met too. Um, I had an extremely foreign minister who's on his way here shortly, actually. Um, I had an extremely uh, good series of meetings when I was there, and as you say, I was able to go up to Jaffna and talk to the Chief Minister, and actually the new Governor for the Northern Province as well. So I had a very good series of discussions. And um, in terms of the, what happens with the UN report, that, of course, will be up to the High Commissioner, Prince Zayed. And uh, he will decide when to table it and whatever. I think there are issues about whether within Sri Lanka's own constitution, within his own uh, judicial, judicial processes, there are sufficient uh, mechanisms to deal with this. Um, but it may well be that there are allegations of crimes which do need to be addressed by an international uh, organization of some sort. Um, I think it's best if we wait until we see, rather than second guess, what this Human Rights Commission uh, report says. But there's nothing to stop the Sri Lankan government, as I said, in the meantime, continuing with the lessons learned mechanism. Uh, that's a, that can continue in parallel, it seems to me. Sir, <clears throat> safe drinking water and sanitation is one of the facets of the human rights. And the co most of the Commonwealth countries are facing the acute problem. Now my request is whether this issue can be taken by the Commonwealth countries at war footing. Because uh, the, so far the sanitation part is concerned, the people in most of the countries, people defecate in op open. So, India is taking at war footing. So likewise, other Commonwealth countries, whether the Commonwealth can do in this connection or any efforts can be made? I think a, a, a Commonwealth gold standard for access to water and water sanitation is a nice idea. We have big charities in this country like WaterAid, which give huge amounts of money for that. So I think that's an interesting idea. But again, I don't think we should Whenever we look at the Commonwealth, think in terms of development, and I would, that would come on to my way of thinking, 
both under people's basic rights, yes, but also it's a development issue, and there are other mechanisms to give development money. But I think as a, if it was considered across the Commonwealth, there should be a gold standard to which all Commonwealth countries should aspire in terms of basic hygiene, access to fresh drinking water, and indeed sanitary conditions. I'm sure that would receive uh, popular support from many member states. Mr Scott. Uh, Bruce Scott, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps uh, in Australia. And Minister, I was interested in your, one of your answers there to do with trade and more could be, well, the important role that perhaps advancing trade within the Commonwealth. Would you like to expand on that? Because that's one of the things that I believe uh, does help developing countries grow their economies, create all the things we aspire to uh, under the Charter. And uh, I think uh, perhaps it's, it's a, a great opportunity to look at that uh, within the framework of the Commonwealth. And how would you see that happening? Well, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, what we all need to recognise, I always make this speech, is that every country in this room is a member of many different organisations. Uh, we live in a world of uh, multi for a membership, um, and uh, I just rehearsed some of the organisations that the UK was a member for, and of course Australia, which in a sense is looking towards the Pacific and its neighbours more, um, you know, also has other uh, priorities. But, but I think we need to, to, to look at what the Commonwealth does better as a result of being a Commonwealth member. What is the added value? And there are statistics which actually prove that, as I said earlier, two, com two Commonwealth countries trading together is, is, is cheaper than trading outside the Commonwealth. That's already an advantage. But certainly, we should do more in, in promoting uh, trade and investment between uh, Commonwealth countries, and the bigger countries can help the smaller countries. And indeed, the first, uh, the first 24 two day meeting of the Commonwealth Business Enterprise and Investment Council, which I referred to Jonathan Marlin's new organization, which met at Marlborough House was itself extraordinarily interesting. He was able to bring people from the Kuwait National Investment Authority to meet uh, people from countries like Lesotho, who in the normal course of events wouldn't necessarily you know, get that access. And it's by brokering introductions and deals like that uh, that we can really help some of the smaller, more vulnerable countries. The bigger countries, they should look towards the Commonwealth and we should have a huge initiative through, uh, through this organisation, I think. And I think, again, a good opportunity for that. There was a successful business conference in uh, Chogham in uh, Colombo last uh, 2013. I think uh, business trade is going to play a huge role in Valletta uh, this year, and uh, that's something which I hope all member countries will take very seriously and support. And finally, the gentleman from Oman. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm Hamid Riyami from Oman. We're not a member of uh, Commodores. <laughs> uh, do you think that there is a need, a big need, to have um, a human rights court uh, in the Commonwealth, uh, like the EU Human Rights or Human Rights Court or other organisation Human Rights uh, Court? Yeah, I, I don't think the. I mean, the as I said, and uh, Oman is a wonderful country and a great friend of the UK, and uh, your evidence here will no doubt lead to huge speculation that you're planning to join the Commonwealth. Um, the uh, but, uh, no, in all seriousness, I did say in my speech that the, the Commonwealth Charter is, is actually, although everyone's, everyone's signed up to it in good faith, nobody had to sign it who didn't want to. But at the end of the day, it's, an, it's, a, it's a coalition of the willing. It's not an enforceable charter as such. But within it are some pretty obvious human rights. And I also say human rights. Human rights are universal. You can't pick which human rights you agree with. Human rights apply to you, to me, to them. It's universal. And, and so, therefore, there should be no need to enforce it. And there are other mechanisms when people violate human rights, either violently or through oppression. Things like the ICC are there. There are other international fora which can address these. I don't think the Commonwealth, which is a, a membership club of equals, should have an enforcement capacity. But it should just be there to say, look, why do you sign these things? If you're unhappy with it, do you know what, at the end of the day, no one's forcing you to be a member of the Commonwealth. There are plenty of other countries who want to join the Commonwealth, perhaps Oman being one of them. Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, I would like to thank Hugo Swire very warmly indeed for giving us such a good start to this morning's first session. Uh, we will understand, Hugo, if you have to depart for other duties, but we appreciate the time you've taken and the, uh, the answers to questions uh, which you've given. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. I wish your conference all... 
Uh, it's now my pleasure to um, introduce Professor Philip Murphy, the Director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, who will make the next introductory speech, after which there will be further debate. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I, I should just say the Institute of Commonwealth Studies is a completely independent unit of the University of London. We are not part of the official Commonwealth. We don't take the party line. And my, um, necessarily, um, um, and my, view, my, my role in these sorts of gatherings is often to act as a sort of devil's advocate. Um, and I, I'm, I think it would have been nicer to have spoken after Karen McKenzie, who I expect would, would have sort of set out the case for the Charter before I start to knock it down. Um, <laughs> but but I, maybe it will put her in a stronger position to go after me and she can simply uh, refute all of my, my points. I, I'm, I'm a historian by training. and I, I know these sorts of events. You, you, you have an anniversary to peg something on, um, and, and Magna Carta is a good one. But uh, as a historian, I couldn't help going back to Magna Carta and looking at it again in comparison to the Commonwealth Charter. And it just reminds you what a wonderful document Magna Carta is. And I'm afraid what a not very good document the Commonwealth Charter is. And it may, it may explain why Magna Carta has survived so long. Magna Carta, of course, came out of a series of sectional interests enforced against the king. But they were wonderfully clear and specific in their expression. You go through the chapters, no man shall, no official shall, no town shall. And when the specifics were too narrow and the charter moves into what one might call matters, broader matters of principle, some of which have echoed across the ages, they are again very precisely defined. That famous clause, perhaps the most famous clause, chapter 39, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions, etc., except by lawful judgment of his equals by the law of the land. Specific. Um, to no one we will sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. Very specific. By contrast, the language of the Commonwealth Charter re rarely descends from fairly lofty platitudes to specific demands, rights, and expectations. Its language is willfully ambiguous. It's slippery. It's jargon-ridden. It's often designed to suggest a consensus when no consensus exists. And I think it's almost irresistible to translate some of the, try and translate some of the sort of Commonwealth speak clauses of the Commonwealth Charter into good, plain, honest, barren speak. And the moment you do that, you create a document that no one probably could sign up to, and certainly not all Commonwealth members. Let's take a few examples. Human rights, the clause on human rights. Um, we are committed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other relevant rights, covenants, and international instruments. OK. I mean, everyone could uh, sign up to that, but let's make it more specific. Let's turn it into barren speak. Give an example. No Commonwealth state will engage or facilitate torture. Well, that's a little bit... Could send a few sort of shivers up the spines of some Commonwealth states. When the, when the Commonwealth Charter was signed um, in 2013, there was a wonderful headline in the British Daily Mail which said, Queen fights for gay rights. Um, and what that actually referred to was the clause, we are implacably opposed to all forms of discrimination, whether rooted in gender, race, color, creed, political belief, or other grounds or other grounds, not any other grounds, other grounds, non-specific. It's completely meaningless. If it's about gay rights, then why not a sort of Magna Carta type clause, no Commonwealth citizen will be punished for engaging in consenting adult sexual relations? Again, because there would be no consensus on that. Um, 
international peace and security. We are committed to an effective multilateral system based on inclusiveness, equality, justice and international law. All very fine. Why not turn it into a specific, like Magna Carta? No Commonwealth state will engage in illegal warfare against another nation state. Gosh, that then becomes a little bit more troublesome. There are other differences. I mean, again, the question is, who is asking for these rights in the Commonwealth Charter? Uh, the way that the Commonwealth Charter is arranged is almost anticipating the kinds of debates and discussions that take place within the Commonwealth and have done over, over the years. So it starts with democracy, human rights, peace and security, often Western concerns, and then balances these with a long section on sustainable development. It's, it's almost anticipating a debate that might happen or criticisms that might happen, rather than being about specific rights and expectations. But there's one, of course, important further difference between King John's Magna Carta, which was that King John's Magna Carta, in its final clause, chapter 61, had an enforcement mechanism. The barons shall elect 25 of their number to keep and cause to be observed with all their might the peace and liberties granted and confirmed to them by this charter. No such enforcement mechanism goes alongside the Commonwealth Charter. So, who is to blame for this document? Its, its origins, of course, lay with the recommendations of the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group, which reported in 2011. But if you look at the group's specific recommendations, you can see that what has happened was not what they had in mind in two specific respects. The Commonwealth Charter was the first and one of the most prominent of over 100 recommendations that they made. But if you look at what they asked for, it was a, com a chart of the Commonwealth which should be established after the widest possible consultation in every Commonwealth country. There was, so far as I'm aware, no such consultation. And I think from the point of view of the eminent persons group, those debates about values, about what might be in a Commonwealth Charter, uh, were in was intended to be as, as valuable as the Charter itself, actually sparking that debate. No such debate really happened. Secondly, and their second recommendation, was that the Charter should be accompanied by the appointment of a Commissioner for Democracy, the Rule of Law and Human Rights, which would monitor compliance with the Charter. I should just say, just to give, us a, just give a little plug, my institute is in the process of putting together a major oral history project on the modern Commonwealth. And we've interviewed now nearly 80 people associated with the history of the Commonwealth uh, since the, 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 the creation of the Secretariat 50 years ago, including many members of the eminent persons group. Um, the eminent Australian jurist Michael Kirby is one of the people we, we interviewed, a member of the eminent persons group, and Kirby makes it quite clear in that interview that he saw those two recommendations the Charter and the Commissioner as inextricably interlinked. One without the other wouldn't work. But of course, the idea of appointing a Commissioner was too challenging for the Commonwealth. And so the Charter was almost the easy option. Um, and so the Charter, in a sense, was, to use that, that wonderful phrase uh, by Peter Cook, uh, an only twin when it was born. Um, it was intended to be one of two um, mutually supportive recommendations. Only one survives. Now, of course, going back to Magna Carta, one could say that the, the overriding lesson of Magna Carta and the more modest Commonwealth Charter is that rulers don't like signing up to documents that constrain their freedom of action. 
particularly where it's backed with the threat of coercion if they fail to comply. King John, as we know, almost immediately repudiated the Charter, and significantly, although the Charter is reaffirmed in a revised form in subsequent reigns, from the time of its first reiteration under John's son, Henry III, it lacked that final clause of the baronial council of 25. Insofar as Magna Carta exerted an influence over governments, both in the UK and overseas in subsequent <coughs> years, it wasn't because it had an external enforcement mechanism, but because it became embedded in practice and in popular imagination, although often through violent and bitter tests of strength. And I, I sort of have suggested in the past that perhaps if the Charter does have a value, the Commonwealth Charter, it will be or would be because popular groups within the Commonwealth take it up and try to hold their governments to account on the basis of it. Um, rather in the way that the, you know, the, the Helsinki Final Acts in the mid-70s uh, which was signed in very bad faith by East German, East, East European governments and had clauses in protecting human rights, spawned groups like Charter 77 in Eastern Europe, calling on their own governments to comply with the principles they'd signed up to. Unfortunately, I don't think the Charter as it stands is a strong enough document to catch popular imagination in that way. And perhaps we should go back to the recommendations of the eminent persons group and start some proper debates within Commonwealth countries about what Commonwealth citizens actually demand from their governments, from their rulers. Um, so Alan, have I got a, a minute or two to conclude how, how we do? I couldn't possibly deny you. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you can see that the, the British government, certainly, is trying to invoke the clauses of the Charter. We've seen it happening quite recently in Guyana, when the government of Guyana prorogued the uh, Guyanese parliament. Um, the British High Commissioner, Andrew Err, got into trouble for suggesting that Guyana might be acting in conflict with the Commonwealth Charter. Uh, over this. So, I mean, I suspect, and it's, it's a shame the Minister of State isn't there to, to confirm this, that the, the British government is using this in its own right as something of a, of a diplomatic lever. I, I, I mean, I just, want to, I just want to round off really, because I don't want to sound too, too negative about this, and I think there is a sort of genuine balance to be struck. Um, the British Empire left in its wake many very troubled, fractured states um, because of the process of international movements of people with very vulnerable minorities. The kind of idea of parliamentary sovereignty based on the will of the majority is often a threat to vulnerable minorities. And the concept of human rights, therefore, is a very valuable one. And it, indeed, the history of the Commonwealth, you could say the Commonwealth should be just a sort of free-for-all. We should say, okay, we have different values. The key thing is to come together and to discuss things. The problem is that, as the history of the Commonwealth has shown, there were always states that were simply beyond the pale, starting with South Africa, uh, the apartheid South Africa in the early 60s, um, Armin's Uganda in 19 leading in 1977 to the first really uh, outspoken condemnation by a Commonwealth communique of a member state's human rights record. So there can't be a free-for-all. There have to be some standards. On the other hand, we've perhaps gone too far in trying to pretend that we have common values. We have a common history. We have many things in common. I think the key thing probably in terms of standards is that the representatives who come to Commonwealth meetings and heads of government meetings are genuinely representative of their populations and that the democratic element of 
that standard should be the key one. Beyond that, we have very different sets of beliefs, values, which give rise to laws that we may not agree with. And we can't expect something like the Commonwealth Charter to paper that over. Beyond that, there has to be a genuine debate. So I don't want to appear to, I don't want to, appear to rubbish the whole, the whole concept. I want to problematize it um, and say maybe we have to think a little bit more about it and perhaps go back to the drawing book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. I think uh, in view of the overall time, we will go straight on to um, Karen. We're delighted to see you. Sorry, the, the, the little hiccup that affected your uh, timings this morning, but all the more grateful uh, that you've been able to be uh, with us. And I now call upon you to address us. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, distinguished panel, distinguished uh, guests. I need to apologize, uh, but I had a serious challenge this morning. I'm uh, on leave from seat this week because I'm moving house, and I had a terrible occurrence this morning. Uh, I've put a Band-Aid, so to speak, over it, and from here I need to rush and go and deal with it again, so thank you uh, for accommodating me. I wish to, first of all, um, express my appreciation to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for asking me to share some thoughts with you as a member uh, of this panel. I also um, come with a different perspective. I think it's not all doom uh, and gloom. I have had the privilege of serving the Commonwealth for more than four years now. Um, for more than three of those, I have been the head of human rights. And it is from this vantage point that I wish to share with you um, some of my perspectives. And I'm going to be very practical um, because that is what I deal with with our member states um, and its institutions on a daily basis. Um, I think you have heard some of the history in terms of when the charter was signed and so forth, but I do want to say uh, something about the fact that um, I think there was consultation because um, we received as the human rights team several of those submissions from civil society organizations, from human rights defenders. Uh, we had to point them in the direction of feeding into national processes, uh, which they did. Um, and we got quite a number um, of those uh, organizations and individuals who were wanting to make a contribution to the development of what we have today. Now, I think we accept that the Commonwealth Charter is an aspirational document. It is a goalpost for us in terms of advancing um, the human rights agenda, and it has served um, a useful purpose over the past two years, and I will give you an indication of some of those as I go along. Now, as well as having symbolic significance, um, as some other charters have historically embodied both the ideal of alliance and that of firm boundary to state powers, the charter has a practical value for the human rights community in the Commonwealth. When we reference the charter in our work, we invoke a Commonwealth consensus on our values. We speak to an agreement which we can build on to realize human rights in, within the association. It is not binding, and this is often quoted as its limitation. It is not, since it is aspirational, it is not a treaty per se. But it does, however, make reference to international human rights conventions that impose legal obligations on states. This reference, I submit, places the UN human rights protection framework at the heart um, of Commonwealth values. This is of re relevance given that a number of international human rights conventions enjoy wide ratification across the Commonwealth. There is some way to go in terms of ratification of all nine core conventions, 
in all of our member states. But the Charter allows for Commonwealth values to reinforce and underscore existing human rights commitments. And this, for us, and from my vantage point as the Head of Human Rights, is a very positive synergy we take every opportunity to leverage. It is worth mentioning in terms of the impact of the Charter, how its adoption has changed the way we work. Its signing coincided with the start of a new strategic planning cycle for the Secretariat, which places human rights at its core. And this strategic plan um, has run from 2013 and will end in 2017. Outcomes relating to human rights promotion and protection pertain to the recommendations of the Commonwealth Commission on Respect and Understanding, the establishment, operationalization, and strengthening of national human rights institutions, improved and constructive engagement of member states with the UN's Universal Periodic Review, and advancing the Commonwealth voice on particular rights issues through global advocacy. And this global advocacy for us um, in terms of human rights is, of course, the Human Rights Council. The Charter has been fundamental in sharpening and deepening our achievements under this body of programmatic work. And in turn, this work has contributed to the embedding of the Charter at the national, regional, and pan-Commonwealth levels. Allow me to share with you some examples. Under the, UP, under the Universal Periodic Review stream of work, and in partnership with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we have been developing the capacities of parliamentarians on their role in the promotion and protection of human rights, inclusive of their role. And this is pioneering because um, parliamentarians don't have a, a role in terms of the universal periodic review as a mechanism. There is only a role for civil society, national human rights institutions, and governments. But it is widely recognized that parliamentarians must have such a role because of the critical remits of mm -hmm. oversight over the executive and lawmaking. So we have been working with parliamentarians in terms of opening up a role for them with their governments. And um, one firm just referencing the regional uh, seminar we held in Africa, one firm commitment of this work um, was the adoption of what was called the Mahe Declaration by participating parliamentarians in which they affirm the values and principles of the Commonwealth Charter and undertake to progress a body of work with the Charter, amongst other things, at its core. We are also assisting small states. A small state, I'm not going to be specific in terms of mentioning this, the state, we are assisting a small state in integrating human rights in current school curricula. The model school and teacher training curricula which is being developed also includes the values and principles of the Charter as an entry point. We envisage profiling this model to all member states at the upcoming um, education ministers meeting which will be held in June um, in the Bahamas advocating that all our member states should consider integrating human rights and the charter in the way that we have done with a small state mm -hmm. into um, the school curricula. Related to that, we have also developed human rights training materials for, young, for youth trainers, which sees the charter as an integral part of the training focus, fostering values-based leadership with young people. These materials have been used across uh, the Commonwealth regionally with a core um, group of trainers uh, who have in turn been training others. And they come from government youth ministries, national youth councils, and civil society organizations. 
We have also used the Charter to influence two member states in the Caribbean to establish their own national human rights institutions. This in a region that does not have um, national institutions which have a particular or specific human rights mandate. Um, they only have um, institutions which focus on maladministration. The Charter has also been invaluable in our advocacy efforts. We have fully mainstreamed reference to the Charter in our public engagements as well as our engagement with member states in the context of our trusted partner relationship. And just to touch on um, what um, uh, the Professor has said before when he was speaking referencing Guyana. Um, I think the, within the trusted partner relationship we have and continue to have conversations with our member states where they are erring, where they are um, straying away from the Commonwealth Charter. This of course is not work that we um, publish uh, or make public, um, but we do have those conversations and we have those conversations at the highest level um, of government. And in Guyana, some of those also um, were taken forward. In the overwhelming majority of Commonwealth public statements, including heads of government, the heads of government communique in 2013, ministerial meeting outcomes, statements, papers delivered by the Commonwealth Secretary General, his deputies and senior managers, the Charter is the anchor. It has been the starting point as well as the end goal of our work. In our engagement with member states in the context of the trusted partner relationship, the Charter provides a non-controversial, and I stress that point, a non-controversial entry point and enables us to open up spaces for dialogue on salient issues pertaining to human rights promotion and protection, inclusive of equality and non-discrimination. From my own vantage point, again, I wish to stress I have had several conversations on sexual orientation and gender identity um, under this rubric in relation to the Charter with several governments and we continue um, to push that envelope. It is with all the solemnity and depth that the Charter underscores that we can encourage our member states to live up to the aspirations they have set for themselves as members of the Commonwealth. We remain realistic but optimistic in understanding that the Charter is just over two years old and that the universality of human rights remains a global challenge. However, the Charter has given us a shared collective platform from which to engage and shape the advancement of better rights protection and promotion in the Commonwealth. Thank you.